television, internet, Facebook, have created an audience, especially media, have created an audience of skeptics and doubt, those who refuse to call, those who refuse to accept that there is anything in life that is absolute. And so then, uh, what I mean by that is that we have been presented with, with, with hundreds and thousands of alternatives. Media presents us with thousands of alternatives a, a, a day. Thousands of alternat alternatives a day. You can do this, you can do that, you can buy this, this, this idea, this philosophy, on and on and on. And as a result, we have, the media have contributed greatly to creating a world of skeptics. And because we, 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 we are presented with many alternatives, 
we have developed a secular, worldly mindset. And when we come to church, we bring that worldly mindset to church. And we interpret what's going on in church. We interpret the message. We interpret a statement or saying in, 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 in light of our skepticism or our secular uh, uh, initiation. Am I talking? I'm not talking about it. I'm saying because the media has uh, contributed to developing an audience or society that is full of skeptics because our schools have embraced the philosophy of secularism as saying that by reasoning and logic, science and logic and reasoning can solve all of your problems. Secularism said don't involve God or uh, faith in uh, uh, ex expl any explanation of life because of the fact that there is no such thing as absolute. You have to decide for yourself. A culture, different cultures have to decide for themselves what is right, what is wrong, what is best, what is not best. This is what we call in our science, so exactly it, cultural relativism, which means that if this culture here want to do it that way, they can do it that way. If this culture will do it that way, then nobody's to say that your way is wrong when it produces satisfaction for you. These are the kind of people, these are the kinds of mindsets that was represented in our, and you part of it. If you don't recognize and understand that you are part of it, then you become the, the, the uh, 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 determiner of what, and the judge of what the many time what the preacher said, what the Bible says, and so forth. So, because of that initiation into what we call secularism. And, and so, yeah, but you know, school says this. And, and, and uh, philosophy says this. And there is a behavioristic science. And, uh, you know, some folks are neurotic. Some folks are just psychotic. Some folks are just schizophrenic. <laughs> so, so man said that, so we buy into it, and we say, boom, this is who it is. And so if you act a certain way, we fit you in a certain category. <laughs> and we go to war with it. But who's to say all of that is right? Man wrote a book, and I studied with him in college. You all right, I'm all right. You okay, I'm okay. okay. So we become the determiners and decide ourselves what this one. And so then that all the, the killing that is taking place today, and I don't want to move on to the lesson because I want to cover some voices that take the day where everybody, the ones who want to commit the crimes and whatever it is, they're crazy. They might not be crazy. This brother here says that he didn't have a girlfriend. The other one says that whatever, you know. I know some crazy folks. I'm not going to call them personally, but they don't go around killing people. There's a lot of folks that are, are really in mental, mental wards and mental institutions, but nobody ever accused them of ever what. And so I'm simply saying that our school, see, is, uh, secular education is anti-God. This is what secularism is. I will go into all of that, but just to let you know that at least I have been exposed to it, we got what we what we call pragmatism. We got what we call modernism. And then after World War II, they came out with postmodernism, which said that, that that's not right. Then we got what we call uh, secularism. We got what we call pragmatism. Then we got what we call utilitarianism and all of this. This is, this is our schools. And so then, as a result of this confusion, Folks on the church, and they listen against the background of all of this initiation, all of this exposure, and, 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 and so the preacher that bear down, you don't have but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, a week to try and get this over. 
And after you get it over, you turn your loose and you go back to your media, you go back to your, when you go back to your training and all of that stuff, and come back. And then we're trying to overdo, undo much of that false stuff you've been exposed to. Am I making sense to you? You're sitting up here judging me right now. Yes, Lord. Somebody said that nigga go crazy. Mm -hmm. But we don't, you know why? Because we're not like David. We don't recognize that wisdom comes through God's word. So the church don't study and give itself and study. You're going to see much of it tonight. You're 100%, you're 150%. And so like I said, the church don't study the word. Like I said, the church, the church not in the word business. Because the church is not in the word business. The church is not in the wisdom business. It should, that's what it should. Come on. Come every Sunday, every Wednesday. Yes. Mm hmm. Yes. You finished? But anyway, it, 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 it should. But sin has been successful in getting the church to relegate its interest and concern and to circumvent mm -hmm. what God gives the church to survive on. And God gave the church to impact sinful society. Satan has been successful in getting us to circumvent that and to take another approach. So then we spend less time. And we, 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 God said, if my people call by my name, shall I'm going to say, pray. And so that y'all didn't want to pray. Come together and pray. Satan has been successful in keeping the church from right. But give a musical. And folks hanging all off the balcony. You don't hear what I'm saying. That's true. That's what I said. It's not the people that's in church, but the one in church. It's all you. Keep you out of the way. You can say it that way. It's to do it collectively, us together. And our fear. It's just like they had a few people changed the phrase school. But you say it in the church. Yes, yes. Well, we, we, we accommodate, we give ourselves to. To that which has been designed by the evil one to uh, 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 been designed by the evil one to weaken us and to keep us powerless. He said, "Don't mind coming together." Satan have 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 uh, what you said that conceded Sunday to church folks. You know they're gonna come to church on Sunday. You've conceded that. But if I get them there, I want to get them to do some other stuff besides what they're supposed to do, besides that which brings power. Yes. <laughs> Would you consider to be abnormal if a person expresses himself in terms of his prayer, his worship, and his relationship with God. If that expression is based upon something that he has been focused on, mm -hmm. or something he's focused on, or something he's going to be focused on. Mm -hmm. Because the focus of life tend to, to, to create or determine really who we are and where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. So if I was focused upon something, and then I turn around and express that focusness in terms of a prayer, or in terms of a worship, or in terms of a relationship. Would that be abnormal? Well, it, it's all depends. It's, it might be normal for one, some person, and it might be abnormal for another person. Because of the fact that we focus on that which we know or what we think we know. So then we talk about focus. We can focus on something. Uh, uh, but that what we focus on may be wrong. It may be a wrong ideology. It may be a wrong interpretation. It may be a wrong sense that we have in, 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 incorporated through tradition. And so I'm going to focus on it. But again, I may be focused on that which does not represent reality and truth. Right. Mm. I, I, Pastor, I agree with you 100% with what you just said. You know, that sometimes we focus on things that may not be reality or truth. But you know, sometimes we get focused on 
something, even though that focus is in a negative, mm -hmm. but because of a relationship that we have, say, with the commandment of God and understanding His word, mm -hmm. we can take that negativeness and present it to God in our prayer in the form of a positive solution. Well, and that calls for understanding. We got to understand that. But if we don't understand that, what we're doing, then uh, it, 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 you know, it leaves us again. If, if we, if our reasoning, our logic, and our focus are uh, negative and faulty, then the conclusion, whatever conclusion we draw, is going to be faulty as well. You're going to be you. You can't think wrong and and and, and come up with a right. Conclusion. Okay, but anyway, that's what uh, I wanted to share. But let me let me move, let me move on. And let, uh, David had gotten his money as a youth from these different places. I told you, but he says that uh, how now we ask, how did he gain wisdom? He tells us, "Thy commandment has made me wise." This true wisdom is from God. Do you hear me? True wisdom is from God. Uh, find it 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 15 verse. 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 15 verse. Okay, look. What Paul says to Timothy? He says, that from a child thou hast known the what? Oh, Holy okay. Scriptures, which are able to make thee what? Why? The Holy Scriptures make you why? Unto salvation. Holy Scripture will lead you to salvation in Jesus Christ because it teaches you that salvation is acquired by placing your faith in Christ. So you will put your faith in Christ. This is the message the church is to be sharing with the lost world. Reaching out to the world, to lost men and women, boys and girls. This is our man, man concern, call it. Our main emphasis, our main interest is to uh, uh, share with the lost person. You see, we're uh, uh, in a day when we judge church service by how good we feel, how good the choir is, and how good this one is, how good Ralph Creek, when the church has primarily been called to spread the gospel, to preach, to teach, to share with men that God has, is offering salvation through Jesus Christ. If you place your faith in him, then you are saved. That's what we that's what the church is called to do. How many lost people this year have you witnessed to? That's your answer. So let's go on to verse uh, 16 and 17. My gift. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. These are not man's words. These are the scriptures, uh, the, the results of God using men to bring to lost, the lost world his message. So all scripture, not just some, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable, beneficial, for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for correction, when a person is wrong, you're wrong. For correction and for instruction in how to develop this life that you have come into as a result of placing your faith in God. 17 words. That the man of God. So you see verse 16 tells us that uh, 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 the scriptures are to be used for this purpose, and if the man, 17 verse, if the man of God adhere to this, the, the man that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good work. I cannot do a good work. I cannot fulfill my calling. I cannot benefit the church. I cannot glorify God if I don't use the scriptures for inspiration, for correction, for reproof, for rebuke, and for instruction in righteousness. That's what I'm called to do, Sister Jackie. That's what I'm called to do. And folks get mad with me because I do what I'm called to do. I'm called to preach the, I'm called to, 
to reprove and rebuke. You're wrong, you're wrong. If this is wrong, you rebuke. Our problem today is that we don't have enough folks and preachers and pastors in their day and time with enough courage to tell the truth because they're concerned about membership, are concerned about money, concerned about pleasing folks. That's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the death of the church. That's the weakness of the church. That's why not, not too many folks pay serious attention to the church. Because the church has lost its power. And it lost its power because it deviated from that which gave it power. And him who gave it power. That is Christ. That is his word. So Paul, David said, all scriptures, not some, all scriptures given, I'm sorry, David said, the scriptures have made me what? Why? True wisdom is from God. Now why? Go back to it. No, go back to Psalm. Go back to Psalm 119. In 98, 98, what is that, 99? Thou through thy commandment have made me what? Wise. Through thy commandment. You see the word commandment. I want you to focus on that. Commandment. Got it? Have made me wiser than my enemies. For they, commandment, right? For they are ever with me. Do you see that? I want you to get this. Your commandments have made me what? For day. You see that word day? It's in the Hebrew singular, which means it. He sees it as, he sees the word of God as a complete whole. That word for day is in the Hebrew singular, which means for it. And so we can read, Thou through thy commandment has made me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever before me. It's a composite whole. It's a com from, from start to finish, from Genesis to Revelation, it's a composite whole. And you can't pull part of the scripture out of here and build a doctrine or defend a position because this book is a whole book. And only scriptures can define and interpret scripture. So when you read Galatians, he talks about that every man bear his own burden. Two verses later, he said, for every man should bear each other's burden. How can it be both ways? He tells us one word, that every man bear his own burden. Then the second, two verses later, he said, bear each other, bear one another burden. I'm, I'm burden. So if we pull one scripture out, we're going to say, you got to bear your own burden. Somebody else going to pull another scripture out and say, well, we're supposed to bear each other's burden. And then somebody else going to conclude, well, that must be a conflict. Because they're saying two different things. No! They're saying the same thing. But they're approaching it from different, two different standpoints. Because the Bible, the Bible, what Jesus said to, to those Pharisees, he said, if you're Pride interpret this as being this way, and I interpret the scriptures cannot be both. <laughs> so, what men, women, consider sometimes to be uh, 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 a contradiction in the Bible? There's no contradiction that comes from the ignorance of our mind and the limitation of our mind. There is no contradiction in the Bible. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Bible. Plenary, verbal inspiration of the Bible. And, and, and those who say, well, that's a, that's a conflict. It looks like this. It looks it's only because of our limitations. And because of our, in many cases, our lack of training and our lack of schooling. But ask the person who 
and ask the people who have studied and understand the language, that what seems to be a contradiction can easily be cleared, cleared up. Look what he said. They are ever before me, or it is ever before me. I keep it in front of me. I keep the word, are y'all with me? I keep the word before me. He says, I'm not before me. I don't lose sight of it. I don't keep it before me when I come to church on Sunday and take God's supper. And then when I leave here and go somewhere else, I put something else before me. Put it in the closet. Put it in the corner. Put it in the drawer until I come back next Sunday and say, I keep it ever before me. When I'm at home, it's before me. When I'm dealing with my mate, it's before me. When I go on my job, it's before me. Our challenge is to keep the word of God before us. You go to that doctor and you're taking that test, mammogram and prostrate test, whatever it is, keep the word of God before you that said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Keep it before you. The source of our distrust, the source of our anxiety, the source of our fear is that owing to, we don't keep it before us. Keep the word before you. When you're dealing with contrary people, keep the word before you. If you don't keep the word before you, you're going to get in the flesh. You're going to operate in the flesh. Yeah, Rev, I know what you said, but I can't put up with that no more. I mean, hey, keep the word before you. And you'll see the words right there. Hold oh, your peace, I'll fight you out. The reason why I got wise is because I gave myself to the word of God and I kept it ever before me. Not just gave myself to learn of it, but I gave myself to follow its instruction and its direction. Am I helping somebody? Listen, make the word of God your best friend. <laughs> like quite a few amen on that one. I think I'll say it again. Make the word of God your best friend. Jesus, your, he's my best friend. He's my best friend. Keep him as friend, but make the word of God your best friend. Amen. Bring your friend with you everywhere you go. Amen. Always know that your friend is by your side. Your friend is inside of you. And if you trust your friend, they'll never lead you wrong. Carry the Bible wherever you go. If not in your hand, yet in your head and in your heart. Do you have your Bible? Oh, no, I don't have it. You ask somebody, do you have your Bible? No, I don't have my Bible today. You ought to have your Bible all the time. I don't have it in my hand, well, but I got my Bible. My Bible is in my head and my Bible is in my heart. Word am I here? We'll deal with that one next week. The remembrance of God's word will lead you to right management. If you remember God's word, you're going to manage your affairs in the right way. If you, if, listen, listen, listen to me. If you remember God's word, you're going to manage your affairs and your affairs won't manage you. You're going to manage your situation, but your situation won't manage you. <laughs> Trouble to church today is that too many Christians allow in their situation and their circumstances to, to manage them. <laughs> Let's go to verse number 97. 99, I'm sorry, 99. Let's read together. <laughs> I have more understanding than all my teachers. But our testimonies are my meditation. I got more understanding than all my teachers. You see, I've been taught by them, but I got more understanding than them. I surpass them. I surpass my teachers. Listen. So then, here it is. But our testimony are my meditation. I meditate on your word. I think on your word. See, not only don't just read the word and then and then go about your business. Keep that word with you. 
meditate on what you look what he said. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. You know what he said? He said, I went to Bible class and I was taught. But I meditate on the word. And I learn more. And if, if Rev don't watch it, you exceed him. I ain't gonna let it happen. <laughs> Those who don't labor in the world sometimes. See, one of the reasons why we got problems with the churches like so much today is because the few have outgrown, in many cases, the pulpit. So somebody said, well, you know, this is not going to cost a muster. I'm going to have to go somewhere where I can be paid. I'm not getting what I need. Now we have the uh, builder's generation who was born before 1946. And the builder's generation are the ones who stay in the church and stay in the church, even if they don't have but five members. That's the builder's generation. I got to uphold it because mama and grandmother and grandfather and my cousin and my nene, I never forget my nene and my father and all of this stuff. They stay in the place where they're not being fed, they're not, being, they're not benefiting, but they stay there. This is the, the builder's generation before 1946. But then you get the baby boomers. They come and say, well, I think I need to move because I need this. And now, since 1980, you got what you call a millennium. The younger generation, they say, well, ain't no big deal to be a part of it. And if it don't, the big deal to be a part of the church, the institutional church, I can serve God with. I'm more concerned about what the church is doing on the outside than what the church is doing on the inside. And so what they do, they look at the church, and they see the church spend all this money on itself. The church just gives to itself, and they say, no, we, we believe that the church ought to be helping other folks. And so the building, and I'm sorry, the, 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 the millennium, they have stopped coming, basically stopped coming to church. And, you didn't, and when you stop coming to church, then uh, our tithe and money and, and offering decreases. And when they decrease, then they don't have the what, money to operate efficiently. Like it should. Y'all don't get what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's why you have almost 10,000 churches closing every year in North America, in America. In this, in America. Because that's the, that's the change. But when folk fail to recognize and fail to realize that we are in a different time and a different day, we don't preach a different gospel, but we have to apply it in a different method, use different methods so that we can reach people where they are. The preacher has been called to move people from a lesser life to a higher life. I told you, and you hear me say all the time, I've been called to place you in the path where God is blessed. And I can't do that by lying to you. Amen. I can't do that by being afraid of you. One if you're going to put me out. One day if you're only going to pay your money. I can't do that because, because of the fact that God's word will make room for itself. Amen. If you don't give the money, God will send folks there who will give money. Amen. You don't hear what I'm saying? Amen. And you don't give money or you don't give service, you hurt yourself. You don't hurt nobody else. Amen. Am I helping you? Amen. Yeah. Okay. I can't be afraid of y'all. <laughs> Let's go first, I'm going to read 100, 100. Let's read together. We, see, you can have fun in Bible church. You can have fun with that word. Let's read verse number, uh, 100. Let's read together. I understand more than the ancient because I kept that precept. Well, I keep that precept. He said, I understand more than the teacher who taught me. I hung in there with the word. Not only did I understand more than my teacher, he said, I understand more than the ancient. The ancient goes behind me. Why? Because the word of God made me wise. The word of God, and I'm trying to make a case for the word of God in your life. You want to be wise? You want to have understanding? You want knowledge? You want to know how to deal with life? You want strength to endure? Get in that word. Read that word. Buy your book or so. Expose yourself to teaching. You know what I'm saying? Now some folks don't want to be, you won't be in a situation where they can shine. 
Did you hear what I said? They want to be in a situation where they can sign. They get together and they rub each other. She don't know nothing. This one here don't know, know less than nothing. And the other one know a little more than nothing. <laughs> and so we can all, all shine. We just praise them. So you got the final thing? Get on the conference on teachers. Give your ears, your heart to learning. I just showed you the scripture that said, all scripture given by inspiration of God and is profitable, beneficial for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Wisdom 100. Heavenly wisdom is the answer to cardinal fallacies. I like that. Do you hear what I said? Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Heavenly wisdom is the answer to carnal policy. Carnal means flesh. Acting in your own mind and doing, trying to do it your own way and trying to understand it, you know, and, and believe it that you can solve your problem and have your situation without God. Carnal, uh, uh, heavenly wisdom. Is the answer to carnal policy. Carnal policy is that tit for tat, butter for fat, you kill my dog, I kill your cat. Carnal policy is I don't care what nobody say, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Carnal policy is to plot and plan to get back at somebody who has lied on you, somebody who has hurt you, and somebody that you feel that done you wrong. Carnal policy is I come up with a scheme and a plan that I want to implement and introduce, or whatever the case is, that has no biblical basis and no spiritual foundation. That's carnal policy, because it looks good. Carnal policy is looking at the electronic television and seeing this big church over here doing this and reading about somebody else doing something here, and then come out, Rev, I think it would be a good idea. That's carnal policy. Spiritual wisdom is the answer to carnal policy. But spiritual wisdom said, no, baby, we can't do this because God has not sanctioned that. God will only bless that which he has sanctioned. I want you to look at it from your own individual life. And if you somebody has done you wrong, or if you made whatever it is, and then you all, all, all frustrated and angry, and you have devised a, a, an approach to that situation, if it's not according to God's decree, you're going to fail. Mm. You're going to backfire. Mm. It's a carnal policy. And all carnal policy could fail because it doesn't have God in it. And God is the only one who can do what needs to be done. He's the only one that can take a lemon and, and squeeze sugar. He's the only one that can. Wisdom is following the instruction that God gives for your life. Yeah. Wisdom is trusting in God with all of your heart and leaning not to your own understanding. Wisdom is acknowledging God in not some, most, many, but all of your ways and let God direct your path. That's, that's, that's heavenly wisdom. Wisdom is go to school. Learn the subject matter. Put the expected answer on the test, but trust God that God will direct your life in every conceivable situation. Because that time you won't be, you won't learn in school. Which there's some situation school can't teach you how to deal with. Mother passed on, school can't teach you how to deal with that. Children passed on, school can't teach you that. Cancer invades your body, school can't teach you that. You follow what I'm saying? But the word of God can tell you that you can be at peace because your God is still in control. Yes. Heavenly wisdom is the answer to carnal policy. By keeping the commandment, we secure God on our side. You see, if you keep God's commandment, you guarantee yourself that God will be on your side. If you do what God says do, you can guarantee yourself that you have an anchor that is steadfast and unmovable. Listen, those who make God their friend are wiser than those who make him their enemy. Those who make God their friend 
are wiser than those who make God their enemy. How do you make God their enemy? By disregarding his precepts, his commandments, his statutes, and what he has, what he requires from your life. Listen, we're going to do the little I understand more than the ancient because I keep thy precepts. Meditate on By meditation, you, you preach to yourself. You come and I preach to you, right? But you see, if you meditate on that word, you preach to yourself. You talk to yourself. Self, be of good courage. The Lord will make a way somehow. Self, you ever talk to yourself? You ever preach to yourself? God grace is sufficient. Sometimes you're getting a little down. You're getting weak. You're getting confused. Talk to self. Self, he fought a man in battle and he never lost a one. Self, he's a doctor in a sick room. He's a lawyer in a courtroom. Talk to yourself. All things are working together for good for those who love God. Self. God will never fail you. God will never forsake you. You preach to yourself. My Lord. You preach to yourself. Then tell yourself, Amen. Amen. <laughs> preach to yourself. And when you meditate on your word, you're preaching to yourself. When you meditate on God's word, you encourage yourself. When you meditate on God's word, you strengthen yourself. Am I helping you? Let's look at verse 101. Look what he said. Now watch this. David says, let's read together. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have refrained. Nobody forced him to do it. Nobody begged him. Nobody had to plead with him. David said, this is my own calculation. I have studied this thing. I looked at it both back and forth. I looked at it up and down. And I have drawn my conclusion as to what is going to be my take and my position with the word. I can, I can reject the word. I can ignore the word. He said, but I made my decision. I didn't consult with my neighbor and all these folks. He said, I made my decision. I made this decision to refrain my feet from not some, but every Listen, I have refrained from every <coughs> evil way. I have refrained from every evil way. Every evil way. Listen to me. I want you to hear this. Every evil way will lead to hurt, pain, suffering, and guilt. Every, not some. Every way. No matter how glamorous, no matter how the glitter, and no matter how easy, no matter how enticing, I want you to know this. Every evil work will lead to pain and suffering, regret, and guilt. Every evil work, God is in control. Every evil work. Cain, after he slew Abel and God confronted him and gave him, gave him his punishment, he said, my punishment is more than I can bear. It will always be. It's more than I can bear. Voltaire, the French philosopher, who said that one time back in the uh, late 1990s, I think, 19th century, uh, uh, for 50 years, the Bible would not be read in a library. And when Voltaire came to die on his deathbed, Voltaire said, it seems as if I am forsaken by both God and man. Hmm. By the same token, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, the founder of the Methodist, Methodist religion, when their mother was sick and her friend gathered around her bedside, said, Miss Wesley, have you thought about Jesus, salvation? She said, I have not left this important matter to the last day. In other words, she said, like the old Christian used to say in New Zion, I I, I, I fixed my business alone. I, every evil way, Judas went out 
stuck and hung himself. The money now is no consolation. He throws the money back. Hmm. He goes out and he hangs himself. Because there is no peace for the weary when it goes contrary to God's plan. Are you, are you with me? Why did David refrain from every evil way? He said, I have refrained from every evil way. Why? Why did he refrain from every evil way? He refrained from every evil way because he wanted to keep God's word. He wanted to keep God's word. God's word was valued yesterday. No, this was after David that she was Oh, yeah. After David had done it dastardly deep, and, 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 and he had repented, and God had forgiven him. And David, I can, I can tell you that what, it, what happens when you follow the evil way. And, and, and so I refrain from the evil way because now I want to keep his word. I didn't always keep his word. I want to keep his word because I know what I experienced when I didn't keep his word. This is what David said. That I might keep thy word like this. So, watch this. I have refrained my feet from every evil way. What do you see here? You see sincerity. That David is sincere about his religion. I want you to get this. David is sincere about his religion. How do I know he's sincere? How do you know that he's sincere? He said, because I framed, I refrained my feet. I was careful as to what I did. I was concerned and considerate of the decisions I made. I didn't say it simply with my lips. He said, that's what I said, come from my heart. He is sincere about his religion, about loving God, about the precept of God, about God's way, guiding and directing his life. How do you know he's sincere? He said, because I put my words into practice. Hmm. I refrain my feet from every evil way. We see proof of his sincerity. David was serious about pleasing God. How serious are you? David was serious about pleasing God, so then he watched his, his word, he watched his, his footsteps. How can this, how can many in the church, this is what God says for you, how can many in the church ignore God's word, ignore the pastor's plea? Ignore the time dedicated to assembling ourselves together and yet claim that they are serious about pleasing God. How can we say that we are serious about pleasing God and when we don't read our Bible in any significant period of time? How can I say that I am serious about pleasing God when I make no attempt to bridle my tongue? That I can say anything and Think anything, hold grudges, mm -hmm. be mad with this one and that one, put down and tear down, on, tear down this one and other. Mm -hmm. David said, if you're serious about your religion, he said, and refrain your feet, but not only your feet, refrain your thoughts, refrain your mouth, or refrain your mind, refrain your mouth. Anything that's going to hinder your spiritual growth and development. He said, I want to please God so badly. And I want to be what he wants me to be so bad that I've taken steps. Am I helping? I've taken steps to guarantee 
spiritual growth. Let's go to verse 102. Let's read together. I have not departed from thy judgment, but thou hast taught me. I didn't depart from the judgment. Some of your judgment was hard. Some of your judgment brought heaviness to my heart. Some of your judgments caused me to see myself as I really am. I, I, until your judgment came upon me, I never realized I was as bad as I am. Mm -hmm. I have almost done right, gotten to be low down mm -hmm. and no good. I've been sucking up the Lord's Supper, but I'm still no good. I've been saying about it and preaching about it, but I'm still low down. That's what David said. I'm preaching, y'all. I don't care what you say. I'm preaching. David said, I have not departed from thy judgment. Your judgment didn't always make me shout. Sometimes your judgment made me pout. Sometimes your judgment had me feeling that I never made a prayer before. Sometimes your judgment came upon me. And all I could do was cry out like Isaiah, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm unfit, I'm unclean. See, your ju God's judgment will not only make you feel good, it'll make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. Your judgment will not only tell you, you you're right, go on. It'll tell you you're wrong, you need to stop. Mm -hmm. So David said, I have not departed from thy judgment. I have not departed from thy, thy, thy judgment. Listen. This is David's testimony. My question, see David's testimony, testimony is, I have not departed from your judgment, from your testimony, from your judgment. That's David's testimony. David, let visit, vision, envision David being called in. He's called in heaven of heaven and he stands before God. God sits on the throne and he look at David and he asks David, what is your testimony? Mm -hmm. David realizing that God knows everything. He knows the secret of his heart. He can't hide nothing. David's testimony is that. <coughs> David's answer to God is, I have not departed from your judgment. I was preaching it. <coughs> Naturally, my question would be, what is your testimony? Did God call you in right now? And, and not, not, not take your life, but if God has called you in, I'm giving you a little break from the human experience. And God says, come with you. Say, come up here. And not, it's not going to take long. And you can, and you're standing right now. Look, right, that's, that's, that's fact. We're standing right now in the presence of God. And God is saying, what is your testimony? Can we say like David? I have not departed from your children. I have done everything in my power. I have taught my children like you say. I have read the word with vigor. I have, I have uh, uh, made decisions that was that was was was, was 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 unacceptable to my wife or my husband. But because I wanted to be faithful and true to you. I incur whatever consequence was. I didn't do it to keep the peace. I wanted to please you. So this is why I made the decision I made. <coughs> what is your testimony? What is my testimony? Preacher, I, I'm not leaving myself out. That's why I got y'all there. I don't leave myself out. <laughs> so y'all can't go home and say, well, y'all here, he here. I'll tell it to me. He asked me. Where then, what is your testimony? You know why I preach like this? Because I want this church to get strong. I want God to bring other folks. I want God to bring folks in here who are looking for truth, who are tired of sweet water stuff. That's right. Folks who still feel, I, well, I won't give me that old time religion. I'm tired of going over there where they're giving me that showtime religion. <laughs> Yes, 
not about condemning us, not about indicting us. It's about recognizing what it takes to get to the next level. He said, why was David, I showed David is constant. He is solidified. He is dug in. I have not departed. The stone came. He didn't depart. He's like seventh chapter of Matthew. The rain came. The rain beat on the, the roof of the house. I didn't depart. The wind came. The wind tried the side of the house. But it didn't fall. The flood came. The flood tried the foundation. It did not move. But David said, I'm constant. Why was David constant? Why was David constant? He said, because thou has taught me. You don't want to talk. Now what you see here is divine inspiration. You taught me. I wasn't taught by Man and his philosophy. You talk. You see, divine inspiration. The word of God is the word of God. And it will stay. It will not and cannot be altered. Man may try to alter it. Man may ignore it. Man may rationalize it. But it's still the same, and it will be the same because the Bible said he is the same today that he was yesterday, and he will be the same tomorrow. What was sin yesterday is sin today. No if, ands, or but. What God rejected yesterday, he will reject today. This why. He said, Thou taught. Divine inspiration, divine instruction. Thou taught me. God taught me. And so he says, because you taught me, I have not departed from thy journey. If it was simply the word of man, he said, I wouldn't have taken it that seriously. If it was simply the word of man, he said, I would have isolated this. I would have just treated it like this. But you taught me. If you told me, then I must follow and obey. Listen to me, if you please. Listen. He followed because this represents divine instruction. Listen to me. If we are willing to follow doctor's orders, if we are willing to follow doctor's instruction, if we are willing to follow hospital staff instruction, if we go to school and we're willing to follow teacher's instruction, mm -hmm. if the airline pilot and the student give instructions, we follow. If players are willing to follow their coach's instruction, why are we not willing to follow God's instruction? Mm -hmm. I said that to you. You go to the doctor, first of all, you got to ask us what's wrong with us. So we tell him we're hurting here, we're aching there, or something here. And then he said, Now, nah, this is what you need. And go take two of this, these, every, every four hours. And, and, and we, we follow instructions. On our way home, we stop to the pharmacist and we get our medicine. We follow the instructions. Am I helping you? And yet, when you come down to God, and you need to. Think about that when you're dealing with your grandchildren or your children and your, and your, your, your nieces and nephews. Those little rats can go out there on a the football field, seven years old, ten years old, and everything the coach tells them to do, they do. Yeah. But when they go in the classroom, the teacher tells them to do something, they pop. Something wrong with our system. How can they do what the coach is telling them to do? and not do what the teacher tells us. How can we do what our learned men and women tell us to do? And we can't do what God said to us. Mm -hmm. It's worthwhile looking into. Am I right? Yeah. I think I'm right. I know I'm right. I know I'm right about that. Listen, let's look at 103. 103. Let's read together. How sweet.
sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yes, sweeter and honey to my mouth. Sweet. There is such thing as a spiritual taste. There is a such thing as a spiritual taste. And what it is here, that David is so excited about this. David is reveling in this soul. God's word has made such a change in his life that David is finding it difficult to express what he really feels. You know, sometimes when you're in a, in a, in a fellowship, in a service, and, and, and you're fellowshipping, and you, the Lord is, is, is moving all over you, and you're moving in you, and you, he's speaking to you, and you just holler, you just wave your hand, and you don't know how to, whether to stand up or sit down. You don't know if you want to run or walk or crawl. You just don't know what you want to do. Because it's all over you. You don't hear what I'm saying? You never got it like that? You never got it like that? Get some religion. See what happens. See what happens. Sometimes you want to run. Sometimes you want to shout. Sometimes you just want to just clap your hand and wag your head. Getting good and good. That's what David is saying. This thing is sweet. Sweeter than honey. God's word. It soothes my doubt. Heals my wounds. He says. It's the answer that I need. Can't be a potent, but I'm leaving shot. I can't be a down, but now I'm up. I can't be feeling bad, but not feel bad. What does he attribute it to, or what does he ascribe it to? He ascribes it to the word of God. That's what he does. God's word provides us with sweet spiritual taste. It's better, you see what he actually said, it's better than any taste our senses can give. And that's, that, that's your favorite food, that's your favorite beverage, whatever it is, it tastes good, right? But God's word will give you a better taste than that. David is struggling to find words to express his delight and his satisfaction in God's word. How do you express it, David? David's like an expression like a commercial. Mmm, -hmm, good. Let's go to verse number 104. Let's read together. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Through your precepts I get understanding. I get understanding. Not through the secular book. I learn how to function. I learn how to make a living. Through the secular book. Through my but it's through your word I learned how to live. Yeah. Through thy precept, I get understanding. What does it mean? What are you saying? Uh, through your precept, I can discern truth from falsehood. I can discern good from evil. Your, your word teaches me what is Honorable and what is dishonorable. What is noble, what is evil. Your word enables me to avoid mistakes in my own life. And it enables me to avoid giving others mistaken advice. Your word enables me to, 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 to bypass the trap that is set. Your word enabled me to get around that pit that will hold me down. That's what David is saying. Your word enlightened my mind. Give me understanding. And by your word, I learned how to handle the difficulties and the, dis and the, and the, dis the circumstances that come into my life. 
by your word. Not only am I able to avoid that which is harmful and hurtful, and that which will degrade me, that which will annihilate me, annihilate me, destroy me, or that which will diminish my joy, diminish my life. He said, your word enabled me to live at the highest level rather than the lowest level. It enables me to avoid making mistakes, and when I give advice to others, it enables me not to give them the wrong advice. Mm -hmm. I preach if I get understanding. Therefore, I hate, hey, watch me say, watch this, I want you to hear this, because I'm, I'm bringing it to a close. I, 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 I hate every false way, not just some false way. I hate every false way. Listen, the way of sin is a false way. It deceives and it will ruin all that walk in that way. The way of sin is a false way. The way of sin is a wrong way. And yet, to man, it seems right. Isn't that something? We've been fighting wars ever since, man. We fought World War I, and that war, war uh, was, uh, was, was, was designated as the war to end all wars, World War I. He said, once we fight this war, we're going to be finished fighting because it's going to settle the issue. Less than 25 years or so later, we that it again, World War II. How haven't we learned yet? We was in Vietnam, in Korea, Afghanistan. Have we learned yet? Man just fight, 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 fight. In Iraq, they've been fighting for nearly 30 years. When will we learn? When will we learn? Oh, we've been carrying on little private wars too. We've been carrying on private wars. Rather than turn the other cheek, we've been counter-attacked. Mm -hmm. The devil is real. Yes, is. Show me Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14 and 12. I'll need but two more, three more minutes. Proverbs. Some say Proverbs. 14 and 12. Look what it says. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It will always be that. Man's way will not bring the utopia that he so desires. Man's way will not bring the utopia that he desires. There is a way that seems right. Another Another scripture probably have said that, that the ways of he said uh, the ways of death, the other one say that it ends in destruction. Man's way will all anything. That's why you hear me pound God's word to you. That's why I preach God's word. Anybody who know me, uh, and know it from, from the very first time I started preaching. Back then when I was about 18 years old, I always preached the word. Nothing else but that's the only thing I'll say. And I thank God today because I preach the word. We have a fellowship such as what we have. I thank God for that. Not because of my brilliance or whatever, but because I preach the word. And because I preach the word, we came from a place where 20 people and 20 dollars to a place right here. Over three million dollars. And never sold a bubble gum or a sucker. Never had to run behind a chick in the kitchen. <laughs> because of the word, whether we like it or not. So. That's why I preach the word, because I know the word is going to do. And that's why I will continue. I'll be a fool. After the word has brought us this far, and that we get this type of honor to change and start preaching something else. 
God's word is productive. God's word will get you where he wants you to be. God's word will enable you to overcome every mountain, every hill. God's word will comfort you in whatever negative situation you're in. God's word is a light that will shine upon your path and show you the way to go. God's word will make you find sweetness in the lemon. It will make you find joy in the midst of sorrow. Right. This is what he said. There is a way we seem right unto me. Let's go back to that verse as I close it. Close it up. Look what he said. I hate every false way. The way of sin is false. It deceives and it will ruin all that walk in it. Not only is it a false way, it's a wrong way. And yet man continue to move. Listen, the more we understand, or the more understanding we get by the word of God, the more rooted will our hatred of sin be. You see, uh, the, 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 another problem with the church is that the church have learned to accommodate sin have learned to make sin a bed button. We're not alone anymore about anything. It's all right. It, everything goes now. Everything goes. You don't have to be committed to nothing. You don't have to be dedicated. And we can be a part of this, the world and a part of the church too. And, and nobody. You don't hear what I'm saying? That's the problem. But the more words you get in, the more you love the word and you love what's right, you love the good, you love God's precept, you love God's judgment, you love God's commandments. At once you used to frown and get mad and angry with the, with the truth teller, but you learn to love the truth. And the more you learn to love the truth, the more you learn to hate sin. That's why David said, I hate every false way. You don't hate the false way because of what the false way do to you or because you think you are better than others. You hate the false way because that false way has ruined and hurt so many people. And many of those people are your loved ones. Some of your loved ones, many of your loved ones going to hell because of the false way. How can you like the false way? How can you love the false way when the false way is wrecking so many homes, causing so many children to be... Mm. Miserable and go to bed hungry. It's the false way. It's the false way causing many mothers and fathers, sons and daughters to be killed on the battlefield in wars. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Because folks are playing political games. Mm -hmm. But yet, mothers and fathers are weeping as the man general or whoever come knocking on that door and say, we just come to tell you your son or daughter been killed. Mm. And some men killed by friendly fire. Doesn't make a difference whether it's friendly fire, enemy fire. Dead is dead. And my heart is hurt. We ought to hate a sin you that we preach. We make light of it and Satan has a ball. And yet many again of our loved ones are on their way to hell. Many folks are dying right now going to hell. Many of them will die in the future and go to hell. All because they took the false way. And all because we didn't take this thing serious enough. To pray for them night and day. Knowing that if I see God to answer my prayer, if God is going to answer my prayer, I have to discipline myself. And I have to do what I can to walk in the right path. Because I can't, like the old people say, I can't live any kind of way and pray to God and ask God to help. I want my child saved. I want my loved one saved. I want my mate saved so badly that I'm willing to sacrifice the fast, to give up the pleasures of life so that God can look upon me and I can give him my testimony. I have stood on your word. God says, because
because of his faithfulness or because of her faithfulness, he said, I'm going to spare their life. See, the more you understand, find me Job 28, 28. I got, I got a minute and a half left on me. Job 28, 28. The more, you see, the more ready we are in the scriptures, the better punished we are with answers to temptation. The more words you get in you, the more, the more word I get in you, the more ready we're going to be. Look what Job said. And to man who said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. He said, The good man says, and the wise man understands that the fear of the Lord, not fear of man, but the fear of the Lord. He said it. He means it. You're going to deal with those who make light of it. I fear God. That's wisdom. I want to read something to you. Now, before you walk out of me, I'm going to tell you, I, 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 we're going to wait until I 